So welcome to the uh, 2017 retreat. Thank you, Yaran, for coming. I'm very happy to be here, and thank you, Thomas, for kindly inviting me. Um, and uh, Today I'm going to share with you some of the things that we've been doing, um, mainly focusing on host microbiome interactions and how they impact health and a variety of uh, diseases. So, so uh, my group and I at the Weizmann Institute uh, focus on host microbiome interactions and how they Im impact uh, a variety of diseases. And uh, when we talk about the microbiome, we talk about a huge, complex and poorly understood uh, microbial ecosystem that resides within each and every one of us from the moment we are born until the moment we die. Um, and only in the last decade or so, um, technology came about uh, to enable us to start studying this really complex ecosystem, this world within a world that lives within us. Um, and, and we realize how important it is in so many ways. Um, we mainly focus on the gut microbiome, which is one of the most heavily populated uh, microbial cultures you'll find anywhere. And they say that uh, one word is worth, uh, or one photo is worth a thousand words, and, and this is one of these photos. This is um, an, a scanning electron microscopy photo taken uh, from a normal healthy uh, gut um, with um, 160,000 fold enlargement. Um, and what you can see here, you can see those bumps. These are the villi of the terminal small intestine. And what you can also see is this, what looks like a carpet of shoelaces above them. And this is the microbiome. These, these are the bacteria that compose the microbiome. And you can already appreciate how intimate the interaction is between our microbes and our human uh, counterparts. Um, we, in my group, regard the gut microbiome, if you may, as a signaling hub that integrates into it many, many signals that uh, come from both um, the host, the host immune system, the host genetics, which I'll, I'll shortly refer to at the end of my talk, but also from a variety of environmental uh, uh, factors which we are exposed to throughout our lives. And you can see here some examples. The microbiome perceives all of these signals, integrates them and communicates them with the host. And uh, we and many others believe that these communication channels are fundamentally important, uh, fundamentally important in maintaining homeostasis and health, and when they go wrong, they predispose to a variety of common diseases. Um, and, um, you know, we, we see it as our life's mission to uncover the molecular basis of these communication uh, channels between us and our microbes back and forth, and how they uh, impact a variety of physiological functions. And uh, when I say we, I refer to my own group at the Weizmann Institute, and our very close collaborator, Ron Siegel, who is a mathematician also from the Weizmann Institute, leading his own group. And uh, many of the things that I'm going to show you are um, the result of a fruitful collaboration between us coming from very different worlds, which is, I think, a unique feature of the Weizmann Institute. Um, and of all the many things that we uh, try to do in, in this uh, realm, today I will give you a few vignettes of um, the work we've been doing in trying to understand how diet impacts the microbiome and how dietary and microbiome interactions um, lead to uh, pronounced effects on health, host uh, health or risk of developing one of several multifactorial diseases. And the reason we're so interested in this particular axis relates to one of the biggest epidemics that impacts our species as a whole in the last century, or century and a half. And you're all, I'm sure, are aware of this epidemic. It's the obesity epidemic or the metabolic syndrome epidemic. And you can see some of the um, quite amazing numbers that uh, are affecting our species as a whole. You can see that, uh, for example, in the US, um, close to 40% of all the adult population is considered to be obese. And even more alarming is the fact that almost 20% of, of the pediatric of the children in the US um, are obese. Um, these numbers are roughly similar in other places in the world. Um, and together with obesity, we see the emergence of uh, closely associated diseases such as type 2 diabetes, which impacts almost half a billion people worldwide. Pre-diabetes, which is uh, the predisposing condition, uh, which impacts much greater numbers um, and many other conditions. Um, and um, another very uh, important observation, which would lead to many of the things that I will share with you today, um, relates to the fact that um, you know, this, this epidemic has been extensively studied in the last 50 years. Um, and um, the dietary um, impacts on this epidemic has been studied as well. 
Um, and you know, you will find many, many, many diets that are attempting to fight this epidemic. Actually, looking at the big uh, numbers, um, in average, half of the people sitting in this room are right now on some kind of a diet as we speak. Um, and one, one of the biggest paradoxes is that if you look at the literature, most of the diets actually work very well and they reduce weight. Um, you can see here one of the meta-analyses um, in this, in this, uh, showing this. But uh, the problem is that when you look at 12 months or longer, 95% um, and more of the diets actually fail and people gain back their weight and they even gain more weight. Um, so despite the vast amount of effort and money and research, uh, we are completely helpless in this epidemic. And um, so we, we like in our lab to, to start projects by asking very naive, simple questions. And the first question that we ask is how does what we eat impact our microbiome and whether understanding these uh, impacts of what we eat on the microbiome can help us understand how this may affect our tendency to develop obesity, type 2 diabetes um, and, and the associated diseases. And, and this made me read a lot of the very boring uh, nutritional literature for, from the 1970s, which basically forms everything that we do in our daily lives in nutrition today. Um, and and I, I think uh, the, the major surprising findings that maybe I should have known even without reading the, the literature was that everything that we do in our lives, in our daily lives, in terms of our nutritional decisions, is based in one way or another on systems that give grades to foods. For example, calories is a system in which we give numbers to foods and based on these numbers we try to devise diets that are supposedly good for our health. Um, an even more widely used such grading system of food is called the glycemic index. And you need to take my word for it, any diet or almost any diet that you've ever tried uh, by going to your dietitian or your family physician or by buying a book in the airport um, is based in one way or another on the glycemic index. So, so what is the glycemic index? The glycemic index is a system that was developed in the 1970s which is based on small-scale human experiments, usually including 10 human individuals, volunteers, that were given an identical food, and then their blood sugar levels were measured after eating this identical food for two hours. So for example, if you would take a group of 10 humans and give them an identical piece of celery and measure their blood sugar levels, the rise in their blood sugar levels after two hours would look like this, and this average rise would be given a number, and this number would be the glycemic index of celery. Now, if the same group of people would now be given a piece of chocolate cake, the average rise in their blood sugar level would be higher, and this higher number would be given as the glycemic index of chocolate cake. Now, if you look in your smartphone right now, you will find endless tables that basically give glycemic index to any food or any meal that you ever would imagine on Earth. And as I said before, almost any dietary intervention that you ever tried or will try is based in one way or another on this glycemic index. Now here comes the big problem. The big problem is that when we try to repeat this experiment, not on 10 individuals, but on 1,000 individuals, the average response to any given food, any given identical food that we gave these 1,000 individuals, was exactly the glycemic index of that food. For example, on the left panel, if we gave a 1,000 individuals one of four test foods, exactly identical to all 1,000 individuals, we gave them to them, for example, a piece of white bread, the average response, the average glycemic response of these people to this food was exactly the glycemic index of that food. But when we looked at the individualized level, the individualized response, the variability in the response was huge. Some people spiked to diabetic levels on this identical food, others didn't care at all, they didn't spike at all. So the average response didn't matter or didn't indicate anything in the individualized level. And in this study, which I'll show you a little later, we also measured people's dietary eating when they were in their regular life. So we had the chance of measuring hundreds of different foods and meals consumed by these 1,000 individuals, and always the variability in people's response to identical food was huge. And already by this, you can understand that, per definition, 
this one-size-fits-all system that we all rely on cannot be true because if your glycemic response to a given food is opposite than mine, then the same dietary intervention cannot be good for both of us. And this, this uh, realization led to a really large-scale project which we termed the Personalized Nutrition Project in which we took these 1,000 individuals and basically asked them to give us one week of their life. And, and in this one week, we collected an unprecedented um, amount of data from each individual. And you can see here what it included. It included a very deep sequencing and characterization of their gut microbiome, both by 16S ribosomal DNA analysis and by shotgun metagenomic sequencing, which allows to sequence every gene of every bacteria in the microbiome. We had them fill many elaborate questionnaires related to what they eat, to their lifestyles, to their medical background illnesses, and so on and so forth. They gave us anthropometric uh, measurements. We developed um, a smartphone app for this project, which um, was used by these individuals during the week, and they told us everything that they were doing during the week, what they were eating, how much they were eating, when they were going to sleep, when they were waking up. So we had a lot of, um, a lot of data from that. Each of these 1,000 individuals was connected to a continuous glucose monitor, which measure the blood, measures the blood sugar levels in each individual every five minutes for an entire week. So from each individual, we had 2,500 accurate measurements of their blood sugar levels. And at the end of this massive collection of personalized data, which was really unprecedented, a very smart group of students in my lab and Ron Segal's lab took all of this huge amount of data and used machine learning techniques in order to create algorithms for each individual that are aimed at accurately predicting a person's response to any given foods, even foods that they didn't consume during the week. And to make a very, very long story short, these are the main findings. So when you go today to um, have a, a diet uh, that is supposedly um, aimed at lowering your blood sugar levels, you go to the dietitian. There is some sense of it because the dietitian would give you a diet that is low in carbohydrates. So, so it, it has some predictability to, to your blood sugar levels. We calculated it to be 0.38. But when we use our individualized data-driven machine learning algorithm for each individual, we dramatically increase our ability to predict a person's response to any given food. We then validated this machine learning um, algorithm on a fresh cohort of another 100 individuals, which were blinded to the previous uh, experiment. And we reached an even slightly better predictability, meaning that th this system really works. So, so we were very happy by the ability to harness um, this big individualized data in order to predict a person's glycemic response to food. And, and one really I think a thing that made us particularly happy is that when we looked at all the different features that contributed to the predictability, the gut microbiome was by far the biggest contributor of features that were useful for this, for this effect. Um, but, but now it was time to put ourselves to the test. So what we did in the next stage, we took a group of new individuals and all of these individuals were pre-diabetic individuals. These are individuals that already suffer from a tendency to develop uh, glucose disturbances. They're not yet at the level of type 2 diabetes, but um, they have a 70% of developing type 2 diabetes within the 10 next years. And as a physician, I can tell you that we have very little to offer them. So, so we tell them to lose weight, we tell them to exercise, they, ne they never do, and we cannot reverse this tendency. So we took this, this group of individuals, we put them through our weekly process, and then we asked the machine learning algorithm to kindly provide for each individual a set of diets that are good for that individual or a set of diets that are bad for that individual. And then we asked the individuals to eat only their individualized good diet for another week and then their individualized bad meals for another week while we extensively measured them, including their microbiome every single day. Of course, each good and bad diet for each individual was different than one another. And we made sure that the good and bad diets were isocaloric, so you cannot blame the calories for the differences. And the result was quite astonishing because even within one week of intervention, we were able to normalize the blood sugar levels in all of these pre-diabetic individuals by giving them their individualized good foods that sometimes you know, included ice cream or beer or whatever, which is completely counterintuitive. And um, equally interesting was the fact that we sequenced the microbiome every single day of, of these two weeks, and we were able to identify groups of microbes that, no matter which person you were looking for, were increased or decreased in close correlation to the good improvement in glycemic response, or the other way around, which are the basis for now stunning these microbes as contributed, contributors to this phenotype. 
Now, <coughs> we also took some private examples of the many different hits that, that uh, uh, came up in this uh, large-scale human studies, and we studied them a little deeper. For example, one of the biggest contributors to a glycemic response, which was very surprising to us, were non-caloric artificial sweeteners. These, these are synthetic sweeteners that we all use for uh, the last centuries, that they've been used by millions of millions of people. Um, results in terms of their efficacy or adverse effects are really controversial. There's like a world war in the field. We, we don't like to be part of it, but uh, uh, we wanted to test whether this personalization effect was also uh, true and maybe can resolve the, these differences that are uh, featured in, in different studies. And this was um, indeed the case. And again, to make a very long story short, we, we found that um, some people with some microbiome configurations actually react to these supposedly inert uh, artificial sweeteners, which are indeed inert to the human side of the metaorganism, but are not inert to the bacteria, which um, can utilize them in some cases. And in those cases, these artificial sweeteners actually caused an increase in glucose intolerance and a tendency that could culminate in actual diabetes, which is very counterintuitive. And we could actually predict which person would be from which group by measuring their gut microbiome, even before they consumed these artificial sweeteners. And this, these results have not been corroborated by over 50 follow-up studies throughout the world. Uh, um, another private example that we recently published relates to bread which was also a kind of one of the biggest individualized uh, foods that, that came up in the big study. I um, mean, in, in this follow-up study, we took a, a group of individuals and one of the groups was given, um, you know, the white bread that you buy in the supermarket, the so-called unhealthy bread. The other group was given the best ever bread that was made in the best baker in Tel Aviv, very expensive, you know, east from France and all of that like the healthiest of the healthiest bread. And they were asked to, to each consume these, these two kinds of bread for one week. Then there was a week of washout. And then we asked each group to consume the other bread. And we extensively monitored them. And again, to make a long story short, we found that there is no such thing as healthy or unhealthy bread. It's all individualized. So 50% of the people spiked greatly on the cheap bread. The other 50% spiked greatly on the expensive bread. And we could actually predict which would you be based on your starting microbiome configuration. <coughs> so, so this kind of gives you a taste of the individualized uh, um, effect that we found related to what we eat and how it impacts the microbiome and our health. But equally interesting to us was that we found that also when you eat impacts your microbiome. And in this other set of projects, we looked or we asked another very naive question, which is, does the microbiome feature a circadian activity? Does it change in its activity or in its composition at different times of the day? And um, I'm sure you're aware that the circadian field is, is a blooming field. Uh, a Nobel Prize was just awarded to the person who discovered the, the circadian machinery, which surprisingly to all of us uh, was first thought to, also, to, to, to include a clock that lives in our hypothalamus, in our brain, but uh, um, in the last 10 years, it was realized that, in fact, every cell in our body has its own internal clock. So we have millions and millions of clocks ticking in amazing, um, amazing coordination with each other, uh, which determines different functions in different times of the day. So, so we asked a naive question. We said that the gut microbiome, in our view, is, if you, if you may, a, a neglected organ. So does it feature a difference in circadian uh, activity, just like any other cell or organ in our body? So we sequenced the microbiome at different times of the day, many, many, many times and in many different modalities. And indeed, we found that the gut microbiome features a very robust and very, very reproducible changes in its composition and activity in different times of the day. You can see here an example of one of the commensals going up during the night, down during the day, up during the night, down during the day. Um, you can see here a functional example uh, using metagenomic sequencing uh, uh, with a uh, a few tens of microbial uh, functions that go up during the night, down during the day, up during the night, down during the day, very, very statistically significant, and even higher functions which necessitate the incorporation of many different pathways. For example, flagellar assembly goes up and down at exactly the same time of the day um, in, in the gut microbiome. So it seems that the gut microbiome features this really surprising circadian activity. Now, now this was really surprising for us, 
Because if you think about it, our gut mi microbes live completely in the dark. So how the hell do they know that it's day and night and change their behavior? And the answer came from two, two major directions. The first answer is that our gut microbiome is greatly influenced by our host, by the human side of our metaorganism and its circadian clock. So for example, if you take wild type mice and you sequence their microbiome at different times of the day, you can see again this very reproducible uh, change in their function in different times of the day. But when you take mice that are deficient in one of the core components of their clock, these are period one and two deficient mice, they don't have any clock activity in any one of their cells, you can see that the microbes completely lose this orderly circadian activity. But the most important influence on the microbiome circadian activity came from the timing of the food. So for example, if you take mice, which normally eat during the night, and you force them to eat during the night, this is kind of the natural behavior of mice, but then take the same mice and forcibly feed them only during the day, you reverse their, their, their timing uh, of feeding by 12 hours, you can see that you completely can shift the microbial circadian activity by 12 hours. So the timing of the feeding is the major signal that tells our microbes how to change their behavior at different times of the day. Now, why is this important? It is important because in the last 70 years, there's overwhelming medical literature which suggests that people that are engaged in chronic circadian disturbance, such as shift workers, you know, physicians, nurses, soldiers, and so on and so forth, are dramatically susceptible to develop obesity, type 2 diabetes, and their complications. And, and for 70 years, th these huge observations were made, but we didn't understand what was the missing link? What was driving this susceptibility in these individuals? So we hypothesized that maybe the effect on the microbes is contributing to this effect. So to answer this question, we performed a set of experiments in mice and in humans. And what we did is we uh, induced in both a severe state of circadian disturbance. In humans, uh, in mice what we did is we used a very well-validated model which changes them between different kind of time zones or, or light-dark cycles. Uh, which if, if you would do this to humans, um, it would be like flying someone from Tel Aviv to Tokyo and back every three days and doing it seven times in a row. So, so this, this would be one hell of a jet lag. In humans, um, we performed an experiment that made, made me the most popular young PI at the Weizmann for a few weeks because I took a group of students and I flew them all over the world and I just asked them to collect their poop while they were severely jet lagged before and after and, and send it to me. And um, the results were that when we induced this circadian disturbance in either mice or humans, the microbiome really got crazy and, and, and very dramatically changed. But, but this is an association. And in order to prove that it actually did something, we took this jet lag microbiome or the control microbiome from either mice or from humans and we transferred them into mice that we call germ-free mice. These are mice that we house in these specialized isolators, and these mice are special because they don't have any microbiome of their own. They're completely sterile. Okay, so they are used as a, a very neat way to prove causality, to prove that a microbiome is doing something. And the results were quite clear-cut. When these sterile mice were transferred with a jet-lagged microbiome, they developed immediately obesity and type 2 diabetes, no matter if it came from mice or from humans. And when they were transferred from a non-jet-lagged microbiome, nothing bad happened. So, so these results suggested that at least some of this um, tendency to develop obesity and its complications in circadian disturbed individuals may come from the disturbances induced on their gut microbes. But this is a two-way street. These interactions between us and the microbes are a two-way street. And even in this circadian story, we recently discovered that it is not only that the host and its timing of feeding impacts the microbiome and its circadian activity, but the circadian microbiome impacts back the host's circadian activity. And um, to do this, we basically disrupted the gut microbiome circadian activity and, and, and performed a, a massive transcriptomic um, analysis in the host, both in the gut and outside the gut. And what we discovered was that there were hundreds of genes that didn't care in the host whether um, 
the gut microbes were disrupted or not, and they stayed circadian. You can see that these circadian genes in the host stayed circadian regardless of what we did to the microbiome. But there were many, many hundreds of genes that were circadian to start with in the host, but lost their circadian activity if we played around with the microbe circadian rhythmicity. And most interesting, were hundreds of genes that were not circadian in the host, but they gained a de novo circadian activity if we disrupted the circadian activity of the gut microbiome. I'm showing you that the, these two circadian activities of the microbes and of the human side of, of the metaorganism kind of coordinate together in, in this wonderful tango um, um, that is really fascinating to us. This was true in the gut. And we, we then wanted to understand how the microbes impact in such a global way the host uh, a transcriptomic program. We turned to epigenetics and we performed a, um, a, a global epigenetic study in, in this particular study focusing on histone um, uh, methylation profiles. We're now doing um, other, histo other, other uh, epigenetic studies and we found that we could pretty much explain all of these microbe associated changes in the host circadian activity by changes exerted on the epigenetic program. So it seems to be a major kind of paradigm by which microbes impact the host in a substantial way. This was true in the gut, but we also wanted to see whether the microbes could impact the host circadian rhythmicity outside of the gut, in places where there are no microbes, in places far away uh, from the gut, and we chose to focus on the liver. Um, and in order to explain such changes, um, the link between the, um, the gut microbiome and places where there is no microbiome are metabolites. And I think this will also be important for the discussions tomorrow, uh, but um, we and the field have discovered in the last couple of years that the gut microbiome is associated with tens of thousands of potentially bioactive small molecules that it either synthesizes or degrades or modulates. And these um, molecules actually influx into the host. And, and this can explain to you many of the impacts which we and others observe in seemingly sterile organs, which are kilometers away from where the microbes live, and can be mediated by these small molecules that the, these microbes modulate or secrete. You can see here, for example, an example from this study, which shows you this, we performed a, a global metabolomics analysis at different times of the day, and you can see that the metabolites in the gut also are very circadian. They go up, down, up, down in different times of the day. But when you look at the serum, you can see the same exact behavior, up, down, up, down. And when you disrupt the gut microbiome, you lose completely this serum circadian rhythmicity of the small molecule, meaning that over 80% of all small molecules in serum are directly regulated by the gut microbiome. Now, this, this was important because when we looked at the liver, we found the exact same transcriptomic circadian changes, um, um, just like in the gut, that happened when we disrupted the gut microbiome. And you can see the hundreds of liver genes that lost their circadian activity or gained circadian activity following us playing around with the gut microbiome. And this was directly mediated by these metabolites. And the functional outcome of these uh, bilateral interactions um, at least in the case that, that we studied, um, impacted the liver activity, which differs at different times of the day. For example, drug metabolism or drug detoxification is different, uh, differently uh, regulated at different times of the day in the liver. For example, when you take acetaminophen or, or um, you know, Tylenol and um, you induce um, toxicity by giving a lot of it to mice or to humans, it really depends on when you give um, this drug. So the, the capacity of the liver to break it down is different in different times of the day. But when you disrupt the microbiome, the gut microbiome, by giving antibiotics or by performing the experiment in germ-free mice, you can completely get rid of this day-night um, impact uh, of the liver's capacity to break down acetaminophen. Just giving you an example of how the gut microbes can impact physiological processes which happen kilometers away and are seemingly unrelated to them. Now, we've, we've studied how what we eat and how when we eat impact the microbiome and how the microbiome imp impacts the, the host. But we also discovered that long-term dieting patterns have an equally interesting impact. And in these studies, we focused on a, on a pattern of obesity, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, which is called recurrent obesity or yo-yo obesity. And actually, if you look at the NIH, 
uh, database, you will appreciate that over 80% of obese individuals worldwide suffer from this recurrent obesity pattern. So most obese people actually are these obese people. And what is recurrent obesity? It's a state in which someone gains weight for one reason or another, goes on in one of these hundreds of short-term successful diets, re reduces its weight back to normal, but within 12 uh, months after this successful diet, 80% of successful dieters go on to regain back all their weight and they regain a little bit more. And then they go on another cycle and another cycle and another cycle, and from cycle to cycle they gradually gain weight. And this accounts for 80% of obesity worldwide. Now if we're starting to understand obesity, we know nothing about dieting, or about recurrent obesity. So we took upon this challenge and we um, developed a set of mouse models that are aimed to model this uh, recurrent obesity pattern. For example, um, in one of the models we, we use four groups. One group of mice, the black group, just ate normal chow, they ate the regular diet, so they gained very little weight. One group of mice, the blue group, ate high fat diet, so they gained a lot of weight. But the important third group, the red group, ate the same exact high fat diet, then we changed them to normal chow until they re reduced their weight back to the black level. And then we gave them another round of high fat diet, and then another normal chow, and another and another cycle, sorry. And you can see, if you look at the third, at the third cycle, that just like in humans, the, um, the mice that were on their third cycle of, uh, of uh, exposure to high fat diet became more obese than the mice in the second cycle, than the mice in the first cycle. So this really corroborates the, um, the human phenotype of recurrent obesity. And this was not only true for weight, it was true for any other metabolic uh, uh, parameter that we measured, such as the glucose levels, LDL cholesterol, uh, body fat by MRI. The more cycles of recurrent obesity these, these animals uh, went through, the more uh, severe their metabolic syndrome manifestations were. And we, we then developed more models for this. For example, a model um, depending on a weight-reducing medication, um, another model um, which, which we induced by uh, inhibiting leptin signaling. So this, this was an important model for us because in this model, mice gained weight by eating normal chow. They just ate a lot of it, so it wasn't diet-related. And you can see that in both of these other diets, again, the more cycles of obesity we induce, the more obese and uh, metabolically uh, sick these, these mice became. So, so this gave us kind of a, a nice corroboration of the human situation. Now, the, the million dollar question is how, how is this regulated? Why is this happening? So to answer this, we chose to focus on the point in which mice were uh, finishing their successful diet and were indistinguishable in weight as compared to mice that were never obese. We call this point the nadir period. And we asked ourselves whether in this point there is something in the mice that remembered that they were once obese and predisposed them to become exaggeratedly obese in the next round. Okay, so, so we looked at this nadir period. The weight was completely the same between mice that were once obese and mice that were never obese. And we looked for other differences that may explain the, the, these tendencies. So, so we looked at hundreds of different parameters in this nadir period, and we found zero differences. So, so mice that were successfully dieting normalized all of their immune disturbances, their metabolic disturbances, their hormonal disturbances. Everything was normalized, except one thing, the gut microbiome. So when we sequenced the gut microbiome during this nadir period, we were surprised to find that the gut microbiome only partially returned to normality after a successful diet. So you can see here in the composition by 16S, in the metagenome uh, uh, analysis uh, for function, and even in the global metabolomics analysis, that the microbiome assumed this intermediate configuration, which was somewhere between the obese configuration and the lean configuration. And it was persistent and persistently abnormal, despite the fact that all other metabolic parameters returned to normal. Now, this was a nice observation, but it doesn't mean that the microbiome is driving this exacerbated uh, tendency towards obesity. So since our lab really prides itself on trying to reach causality with the microbiome, we, we tackle this in many different ways. I'm, I'm just going to show you a couple. In the first set of experiments, what we did is we induced a single cycle of recurrent obesity. So you see the red group gaining weight and then changed to normal chow, losing weight. But rather than inducing a second and third cycles, we left them at this point and we sequenced the microbiome at different time points to see when it would normalize back to, to normal levels.
And we were surprised that it took the microbiome over six months after a single bout of recurrent obesity to become indistinguishable from a microbiome that was never obese. So, so this recurrent obese microbiome was exceedingly persistent. It memorized the, the previous episode of obesity for over a quarter of the lifespan of a mouse. So, so this was very, very surprising to us. But when we reached this level after six months in which the microbiome was no longer different than a naive microbiome and then gave the second bout of obesity, we had no differences which suggested that if you lose the differences in the microbiome, you lose your exaggerated tendency to develop weight regain. But the killer experiment is again the transfer experiment into sterile germ-free mice. So when we took in these nadir mice, the microbiome from mice that were once obese and the microbiome of mice that were never obese and transferred them into sterile germ-free mice, you can see that when we transfer the memory microbiome into germ-free mice and gave the recipient mice high fat diet, they develop exaggerated obesity and a tendency to develop type 2 diabetes, proving that this persistent microbiome was driving the exaggerated weight regain phenotype. We then used our computational capabilities to try and predict um, this tendency. So we took the Nadia microbiome and we developed this machine learning two-step predictor, which enabled us not only to tell which mouse would gain weight in, when, when reintroducing to high fat diet, but actually how much weight it would gain. So, so if you would extrapolate this to humans, you would think of a human that uh, gained weight, successfully dieted, now comes to your office and you take their microbiome and you tell that person, if you go back on a obesogenic diet, you will gain 7.9 kilo. This, this, this was what this enabled us to do. In, in a quite accurate manner. And when we looked at the features that contributed to this ability to predict, we found that there was no one bug that kind of predict, uh, enabled to predict. There were many, many hundreds of different features from the microbiome, each contributing a little bit to the predictor. So, so you cannot do this at home, basically. You need these elaborate machine learning technologies to take all of these features, which, which you cannot guess, and, and put them together in, into a um, robust predictor. We then wanted to find the mechanism, the molecular mechanisms by which this persistent microbiome induces this tendency of recurrent obesity. So we performed a, a very detailed metagenomic functional assay on this nadir microbiome and coupled it to a very detailed global metabolomics function and developed a computational way to put together this genomic and metabolomic uh, data together which would narrow down our suspects. And, and we got really lucky here because we found a single pathway, isoflavonoid biosynthesis pathway, and two metabolites of this pathway that were consistently suppressed in this memory post-obesity and post-dieting microbiome. And we performed a series of experiments validating these, uh, these uh, reductions um, and trying to reverse them by giving back these metabolites to mice that were post-obese and post-dieting and deficient in them. And once we replenish the physiological levels of these two metabolites from this pathway, we completely prevented this uh, recurrent, this exaggerated recurrent obesity phenotype, meaning that this pathway in these two metabolites, at least in mice, is responsible or partially responsible for this memory leading to exaggerated metabolic phenotypes. We then wanted to, to know what these two molecules were doing, so we performed a set of quite elaborate metabolic studies, and we found that these molecules actually impact the adipose tissue, they impact ad adipose cells, and specifically, they impact their capacity to perform energy expenditure, to, to release heat uh, rather than to accumulate uh, calories. And, um, and, and we found the, the metabolic uh, pathway that uh, this was mediated through, which included, in this case, a transcriptional regulation of a key protein called uh, uncoupling protein 1, which is responsible for uh, the decoupling of uh, OXFOS, which leads to heat release or to fat accumulation um, in, in uh, different scenarios. And once these two molecules were absent after a round of obesity and dieting, this uh, system was skewed towards fat accumulation rather than towards energy expenditure, explaining the tendency to regain weight. Interestingly enough, two weeks after we published this paper, came a paper in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine um, uh, describing a cohort, a 10-year cohort of thousands of individuals, of human individuals, and showing for the first time that recurrent obesity 
is not only common, but it is an independent risk factor for many of the metabolic events. So, so if, if you suffer from this particular form of obesity, you have an increased tendency to develop cardiovascular disease, death, MI, stroke, and even you onset diabetes. And we're now following up on our um, studies in mice um, in utilizing the same exact technologies in trying to see whether we can identify a memory microbiome signature in humans with recurrent obesity that could be maybe manipulated um, in this context. And the last couple of slides, I will show you um, an unpublished story or a soon to be public story. So, so I've talked to you a lot in this talk about you know, the contribution of environmental dietary factors to the composition and function of the microbiome and how this, these interactions have great impacts on the host. But one of the biggest open questions in the microbiome field is how important or central these environmental factors are in impacting the microbiome and how they compare, for example, with genetics, with the host genetics. And does the host genetics, the human genetics, impact more or less the microbiome than these environmental factors? And, and this, this question has not been uh, answered uh, concisely. And since we've sequenced very extensively the microbiome of 1,000 individuals, we took upon this challenge and we spent a little bit more money and we also sequenced their human genome. So now we have a big cohort of individuals in which we have both data sets and we can directly compare their impacts, at least on the environmental readouts that we have in this cohort. Now Israel is a very good place to do genomic studies because it's, it's a very ethnically diverse country. There are people coming from all over the world. There are Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardi Jews and there are Arabs and there are Ethiopians. And uh, so, so looking at the, the genomics, you can really easily differentiate the origins, the ethnic origins of different people in this cohort. But when we look at the, the microbiome, we could absolutely see no signal corresponding to these ethnic changes. We then look at, we looked at over a million SNPs uh, that we sequenced in this population, including uh, hundreds of SNPs that were suggested in previous studies to be associated with the microbiome. None of them actually overlap with each other. And in our case, we, we hardly found any SNPs that were um, significantly different in respect to the genetic variability of people. So we actually see very little to even non-existent um, genetic uh, influence over the gut microbiome composition and function. However, when we look at the environmental factors in the same cohort, we see a very big impact on the variability of the microbiome. You can see here our top 20 uh, list. Uh, you can see here the artificial sweeteners coming up again, which made us very happy as contributors to the variability of the gut microbiome in, in individuals. So from this, um, from, from this data and, and from actually reanalyzing other people's data, we uh, came to the conclusion that the contribution of the host genetics to the composition and function of the microbiome is very small. We estimate it to be somewhere in the vicinity of 2 to 5% of the variability as compared to a very large influence by the environment. However, the, the most interesting finding, in my view at least, is that since, since we identified the host genetics and the microbiome to be independent of each other in impacting the microbiome, we then ask whether they impact in an independent way the host metabolic phenotype or the host phenotype as a whole. Now you can see, for example, that if you look at uh, height as a phenotype of the host, height is only contributed by the host genetics. There's absolutely no impact of the gut microbiome on our height. However, when you look at a number of metabolic uh, parameters such as fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1c, waist-hip ratio, body mass index, and so on and so forth, you can see that the genetic and microbiome composition are completely complementary to each other and they are additive in, in explaining a large fraction of the variability of humans, meaning that the genetics may not impact the microbiome, but they interact with the microbiome in impacting many of these host metabolic phenotypes. And of course, we and others are deeply engaged in trying to find what are these uh, contributions. So to, to summarize, I've, I've tried to convince you that I think the state of the art of the microbiome field is, is, is going from a generalized population-based uh, characterization of microbiomes in different disease states and health states to a more personalized approach that enables us to really understand the different manifestations of different subgroups of humans based on their 
individualized sets of big data, including the microbiome, but not only the microbiome. And, and, and we find this particularly exciting and, and, and important because, because we feel that um, by greater understanding of, of this individualized uh, um, impact, we would be better equipped to harness microbiome modulating treatments into patient subsets and, and to really tailor treatments in a more effective way. Um, and these could include, for example, uh, um, personalized nutrition, which I've shown you, which is a, an elaborate form of what we call prebiotics um, and, and may modulate the microbiome in different individuals towards one that is less risking for disease. Um, we can uh, think of a personalized uh, fecal microbiome transplantation as a form of personalized probiotics. Uh, which would uh, shift from uh, you know, this present situation in which we go to the supermarket and buy probiotics that someone decided to give us to one that is based on measurement and given metabolites, and I've shown you one example of that, uh, equipped to a particular clinical context or to a subgroup of individuals, we call them postbiotics, um, and together um, I envision in the future an ability to harness the microbiome in a personalized manner to impact health and disease in the humans. And um, I will finish by thanking the many people in my group that have been doing everything that I've told you about. Uh, I've not mentioned many names, but many, many people here are involved um, in this work. They're great people coming from all over the world. Um, our many collaborators from across the world, the funding agencies uh, which are making everything that we do possible. Um, and I think I'll stop here. Thanks.